Welcome back to Lunatia, where we're going into the best level of the game. Piera, Pignolot, Liz, and the stay. So here's a quick bit of advice when watching this level. Listen. You can hear this kind of mournful almost funereal music playing in this early stage. But listen carefully to the music in this level. Because it plays such a big part in what makes this level so good. The subtle ways in which it changes. And little stings that pop up in certain rooms. Listen out for them. If you really want to listen, then in the thread I've posted a video of just this level without me commentating. So you can just hear the music. It's probably, I think, the best bit of musical work in the game. Because it's incredibly simple and at the same time brilliantly reflects the level and the world in which it's in. It kind of in a way reminds me of the closing music from Door to Phantom Isle. And I don't think this is any kind of, co of coincidence. but with a slight tinge of hope that the destruction is leading to the creation of something bigger. But about the level itself. The main thing about this level is that it pretty much throws every single gimmick that's existed over the course of the game. Every single mechanic we've been taught to learn, everything we've tried to master, and had to master indeed, over the course of the game, comes together in this one final grand challenge of all the skills you've learned throughout the game. Everything you know about the enemies, and indeed for the 150 gems, everything you know about collecting gems comes into play and is tested in this level. And that's really what a final level should be. It should be one grand test of everything you know. See, listen. Yeah. 
sound of that music. This is all no coincidence. All this music is here for a reason. And you'll hear more little bits as we progress through the level. Even those whistling gusts of wind play out to a tune and keep the feeling of the level rolling. There aren't really any truly difficult puzzles in this level. Where you need to go is never obscured or anything like that. It's all about having the skill to get where you need to be on a largely linear path. climb higher and higher. And those boomerang enemies return again from door to phantom isle. I believe it's the first time they've shown up in this game. But they're one of this area's main enemies. Another prominent part of the level are these short lasting platforms. They can be a bit of a chore in this section, having to use them to effectively stay afloat just to get that moment dog piece up there. But provided you have patience, it's not a hard piece to get. I think this kind of emphasizes one of the major points of the series. Getting where you need to be is often less about having the raw talent and more having the will and the patience to keep trying until you find the right thing. This is a kind of challenge we haven't seen really at all throughout the main game. Something of a marksmanship challenge. Although as anyone who read an instruction manual back in the 8 and 16 bit days might remember because it was in pretty much every single it was in the manual for pretty much every single Mega Drive game I owned and some of the Master System stuff as well watch traps the key to getting past them is knowing how they work and so it is with this section all three of those flying moves will at some point stop directly in front of you it might be at the back of their circle or at the front but they will stop and you will be able to hit them if you're just patient and you don't try to rush the shot
This section is one that I think people will trip up on. Because up until this point, the one defining characteristic of puzzle sections involving the gem smashers has been that the enemies don't respawn until the gem smasher is dead. This is the one section that bucks that trend. It's a slight design misstep, if you look at it that way. But I don't hold it against the game. Just like all the Klonoa games, this whole finishing section of the game in the Kingdom of Sorrow it kind of plays against what we typically expect the end, the final stages of a game to be. It should be this last desperate race for glory. <laughs> or a grand, bombastic final challenge. Leading to the confrontation of the evil we've been chasing this whole time. But in this game, we don't know what we're going to face. We've never seen the King of Sorrow. Indeed, we hadn't heard, even heard of him. Until very recently. And there's nothing bombastic about this level. We're just climbing a ruined tower with very subdued music. A very washed out colour palette compared to the rest of the game. Even though we're approaching the end, there's no celebration or retrospective of the places we've been. Because if you've played the games up to this point, you know what's coming when we leave this world. You know what's going to happen when the game is over. And we do exactly as the game wants us to do. We think as Klonoa. Though what we're doing is ultimately for the greater good. We may not like what happens to us when it comes about. While this level is by and large very well designed, hopefully this goes some way to explaining why I consider this whole series 
and this game in particular so highly. Because it's one major gimmick, that of the Dream Traveller. It means it has to kind of go against a lot of design cliches. Because just like in Door to Phantom Isle, we can't stay in this world. We're effectively a workman. We came here to do a job, and no matter how well we get along with the inhabitants, when the job is done, we have to leave. It's a little annoying waiting for those things to return, but at least in this environment it allows for a little quiet contemplation. a lot of snippets of music we've heard before. how much I'm trying to keep down on the unnecessary talking through this level. I really do encourage you to go and watch the no commentary version of this. Just to hear every little bit of the sound in this level. Dark, 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 dark,
Any guesses as to the owner of the voice? In keeping with the spirit of the last level, this actually the final non-boss level in the game. Stick to that same tradition. It's something we've grown used to seeing. It's something we've looked forward to a lot from the very beginning of this game. From the very beginning of this whole thread, I was hyping it, I've been hyping up the hoverboard a lot. But everything kind of bucks here. It's just, there's no fanfare for it. It's just another method of transportation. There's no huge... There's no huge fanfare celebrating its arrival like there has been previously. just presented. Just the tool we need to get us to where we need to be. And this whole level has a very different feel to the past hoverboard levels. Even when fighting a boss, it's always there's always been the sense that the hazards we faced on this thing have all been relatively natural hazards. Icy mountains breaking apart. It's never seemed like the stuff we faced has been deliberately trying to make us fail. That's pretty much exactly what this level is. Everything seems designed as a trap. And while it's much less important in this level as it was in the previous level, I urge you again to listen to the music hearing all the little callbacks, all the little touches. Because in a way they kind of go together to form to form the end of game retrospective. The, the places we've been, the people we've met. Even the music and voices we've heard. And here, right at the end, that voice again. It's only faint, but if you're listening for it, it is there. quick actual gameplay note about those gems. They race away from you, so the only way to catch them is by use is by actually utilizing the speed up and slow down controls that you have on the hoverboard that up until this point you really haven't needed. Although in this level it's much more necessary to know when to speed up and when to slow down. 
because that's pretty much the only way you're going to dodge the hazards. As we speed towards the light, I'll see you next time for the final.